Hello, welcome back to Holistic Inner Balance. You have me, Hadley, and Dr. Nicole Kane. Hey, as your hosts today, and we are going to be talking to you about the last two types of anxiety of the eight types of anxiety and how they relate, how Ayurveda relates to them and how to really start to balance them in your life. We're going to be talking about neurological anxiety as well as endocrine anxiety today. So we'll get into what all of that means. If you don't know what neuro neurological <laughs> um, and endocrine means, those are some big words, especially if you don't have like a psych degree. <laughs> So we'll go into what those mean and we'll go into how we actually um, start to balance those things with the doshas. I love this. And it's been such a conversation for growth, especially holding me accountable as a physician. I was just telling Hadley this um, just before we started recording this, that it's so important to continuously reframe what our symptoms are, which is your body telling you what needs heating healing and how, and this beautiful Ayurvedic picture that we see playing out with the different types of anxiety gives us solutions to actually restoring balance, as opposed to looking at symptoms as the problem and then trying to silence and suppress them. And I love that, that it can really personalize to what each individual is going through. Yeah, totally. I'm, that's where Ayurveda really shines is, is that, um, you know, that individualized approach and looking at the doshas and being like that, this dosha is coming up in this symptom because it's trying to tell us that, that we need the opposite quality or we need this other thing. Um, and so once you start to kind of have an idea of the doshas, it's really cool. Like even like my husband who does not study this stuff at all, like he, you know, he's a software engineer, <laughs> not at all in this world. He knows like, oh, I'm feeling really vata today. Like he knows this stuff. Um, and he knows when he feels a certain way in his body or when he feels a certain way, like mentally or emotionally, he knows that it's actually going to be able to, um, that he's going to be able to balance it out with its opposite qualities based on the doshas. So it's really cool once you start to know the language of the doshas. I want to give like a really obvious or clear or concrete example of how we can be in a state of dosha imbalance and then we can aggravate that dosha imbalance just to like, because I feel like we're getting into like kind of complex conversation today. You know, we're going to talk about like when you're in a vata state of thyroid, what does that look like? And what do you do? But I want to make sure that we're not just like in this theoretical and maybe we can give an example of like, you were feeling like this and you did this. And I bet you felt worse because. <laughs> so I was yes. wondering if you had uh, an example that you could share. Yeah. So a great example, I'll just go with the Vata example that I was talking about with Todd, uh, where he, you know, let's say he is feeling really distracted and that's a total Vata, you know, like just feeling like spacey, distracted. Um, maybe he like trips over something and like hurts himself. This, this happens. <laughs> yes. He has a decent amount of Vata. Um, and and maybe he does that like a couple times in a row. There's like a couple different things. And he's like, yeah, I know. I'm like feeling pretty bots, I say. And so in instead, so what he could do <laughs> is lean into the vata and just be like, you know, like have so much more of this, like maybe eat like popcorn, uh, which makes you have like way more vata. If you think about popcorn, it's basically air, right? Like <laughs> we're, we're just putting air into our, into our bodies. Um, maybe drinks like drinking like a smoothie, um, that's like super cold and, um, and then makes you feel bloated or, or whatever it might be. And that can make, a lot of times we will crave things that get us more out of balance. Ooh, another one that, another thing Vatas usually crave is like bubbly water, which is air, in like cold. literally water infused in air. Like, yeah. Air, sorry, yeah. Air infused water. So it's literally like Vata in a can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we crave these things that get us more out of balance typically. Um, 
uh, the other thing is that we like then crave more stimulation, right? We're like, Ooh, I, I want to go do this and do this and do this and do this. And what we really need is to ground down, add some fats to the diet, add some, um, uh, more like grounding practices, nervous system regulation practices, um, maybe some hot tea that does not have bubbles in it. <laughs> um, maybe some, uh, golden milk, you know, that's even more soothing for the nervous system because we've got the fats in, uh, milk or whatever type of milk you use. Um, or maybe you add some ghee to it or whatever. Then we've got this is all vata pacifying and that's what's going to actually balance the vata. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that. And I'm thinking about what you're saying and it makes me think about explaining it to like a fourth grader and like if if you're outside in the Midwest in the winter and you're really really cold, if you drink a big glass of ice water, mm-hmm. it's probably going to make you more cold. And so when you're in a state of imbalance, and so in Ayurveda, we call those doshas, vata, pitta, kapha. If you do something that feeds into that or amplifies that, your symptoms will get worse. And so if you're freezing and your teeth are chattering and you're really, really cold, you want to have something that's nice and warm. You want to have something that's the opposite to pull you out of that state of extreme and more into a state of balance. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about when you're talking about pacifying doshas is that when we look at your symptoms in whatever way they're showing up, you know, we have these eight types of anxiety we're teaching on right now is that there's an imbalance. It's showing up in symptoms. And what we can do is by understanding what that imbalance is, is we then have tools to restore balance. Is, Is that resonating? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And we're never going to get to a place where we're in static balance. So I think that's a common misconception that people have is, well, I just need to get to balance and then I'll be there and then I'll be like, good to go. Right. (laughs) I used to do this all the time. I used to be like, once I lose the weight or once I, you know, do this thing, then I'm, then I'm fine. Then like everything is like, perfect or whatever I was thinking at that time. Um, and really it's more of a dance. It's like balance as the seasons change, as our bodies change, our bodies are very cyclical as we go through our stages of life for women, as we go through them, our monthly cycles, we tend to be We tend to think that that balance is static, but, but really we just need to, uh, respond to what is happening in our external environment, what's happening in our internal environment. Um, and that's kind of what balance really actually is. Yeah. It's like, as long as you're riding the bike, AKA alive is you're (laughs) going to need to balance yourself because this, the process of riding a bike requires balance if the whole time, the right? Then you got to lean to the left. If you tip to the left, you got to lean to the right. And so that yeah. is to be alive and is to be human. And so it's not as though you get on the bike and then you can just stop balancing. Right. Once you, <laughs> once you found a balance, you're not done. So you're yeah. kind of describing, it's like, it's a continual process, but your body won't have to go out of balance as far as extreme with such extreme symptoms. If you can start to recognize the signs of imbalance really quickly and early on. And that's by learning about your body, learning about symptoms and changing that narrative of what a symptom means and what to do about it. Exactly. Yeah. When you can, when you can like get that right away and be like, Oh, I'm feeling a little Vata today. What do I need to do to ground that down? Then you don't get into this like state of just absolute panic and you're running around and rushing around and, you know, you have all of these things that are, that are, um, stressing you out and, you know, and then causing anxiety in the long run. Mm -hmm. Um, then when we start to, when we do it, when it's just starts to happen, 
then we're going to be able to, to, uh, stay in more of that balance. So we're not like falling over on the bike and then getting back up on the bike and then falling over the other way, like getting back up on the bike. I love this analogy. It's a Chumbawamba like, song. really got to go with it. Yeah. 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 This bike is now our new Chumbawamba. And if you guys don't know what that means, then you're way too young or I'm way too old and Google it. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it means. It's that song. <laughs> Um, I get knocked down, but I oh, get up again. Oh, yes, you know, I do. You're going to keep me down. That's a great song. That's a great yeah. Shut the number, y'all. I feel like <laughs> half of these episodes, I'm singing some like weird, strange song. Oh, which, by the way, <laughs> she texted me the other day. <laughs> In January, mind In you. In January, after after the holidays. And after she was- <laughs> the holidays. <laughs> she was watching... Um, Santa Claus is coming to town, which we've talked about many times on this podcast. Now. It's the theme. It's the total lack of doodlery that is the holistic inner balance. Yeah. yeah. She sent me a video of the uh video the uh put one foot in front of the other song. So if you Warlock. still have not looked that up at this point, you gotta look it up. <laughs> Let us yeah. know if you watch yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That's like the one thing people are gonna get out of this podcast, just the yeah, winter DM us. warlock on yeah. instagram let us know <laughs> dm us yeah so i feel like this is such a good segue actually it's not a segue at all but here let's embrace this not segue segue into <laughs> we're Carol. just pivoting <laughs> we're just gonna pivot we're gonna just do an about face yes. <laughs> no no volley up here we don't need that <laughs> we're gonna talk about neurological anxiety first And so uh, neurological anxiety, what the heck is that? Yeah, because I was, I wasn't sure. I had to was like, (laughs) can you just like introduce what the heck this is first? And I said, yes, because it is a big word. And so think of nerves, think of neurons and think of muscles, tendons, ligaments. So this is your nervous system. And so when in a state of imbalance, and you're feeling anxious, if you feel like you get tight muscles, shoulder tension, neck tension, back tension, stiffness, pain, if you get tingling or numbness or zapping pains or shooting pains or cramps even, um, this is neurological anxiety. If you get migraine headaches, some people will get peripheral neuropathy where it feels like you sat on your foot, but it could be anywhere in your body. This is neurological anxiety. And by identifying the neurological anxiety as a type of anxiety, it gives us strategies to restore balance so that the symptoms aren't having to show up as neurological anxiety. And so Hadley, tell us about neurological anxiety and Ayurvedic medicine. I'm kind of curious if we start with it where a lot of my patients will show up and they'll have like burning, tingling, really irritated nerves. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So anytime you hear the word burning, anything that's related to fire, if you've been following along with these, the, this, uh, series, you know, that fire is pitta. That's the, the dosha that, um, that we've got going on. So anytime they've got burning or really like any sort of pain, there's some pitta involved. Any sort of pain, there's at least some pitta involved. It might not be fully pitta, but but we've got some of that going on. Usually there's like inflammation, um, any sort of like redness, um, like a raw uh, or a shooting pain or anything like that. That's all going to be pitta. And so... Uh, at the same time, well, let me know some of the other symptoms that come with it that are not the burning ones. And then we'll talk about that. What about like muscle tension, spasms, gripping, soreness? Mm-hmm. So spasms, we can think of it, right? Like is it's involuntary movement of a muscle. And when we have any sort of movement, that is vata that's the air and ether qualities which are or elements which are which is vata right it's movement mobility is is the um 
the name of the game <laughs> for Vata. So anytime we have any of that, that's going to be more, uh, more Vata. Tension can sort of be like a interplay between Vata and Pitta um, because there's like that, that gripping uh, or that in, the intensity sort of comes from Pitta, but the, um, the, like movement, the involuntary contraction, maybe that comes more from Vata. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. I talked over you. I just got so excited that I might've known one of the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so tension is like you have this, yeah. this like this tension and spasm from the Pitta, but then like the involuntary movement from the Vata. Exactly. Yeah. If there's like a, um, you know, you, there can be some interplay of like Kapha in there too. If there's like tension for a long time and, and it's just like holding because, because mm -hmm. Kapha is like the stubbornness Kapha is like holding things there. So you can mm -hmm. bring in some Kapha there. Usually that's a protection mechanism because Kapha comes in when there's like too much Pitta that's burning things out, or there's too much Vata that's just like moving things around and making, depleting things. Then Kapha will come in and be like, Oh, I've got you. I can protect you. Right. And so, um, and so then the kapha might come in over time. If this, if these things are happening over time, then kapha might come in and try to protect, but then obviously it just makes it a little less pleasant. <laughs> so somebody is like this, like heat burning fire, irritated nerves, this like shooting, zapping, painful, that's going to be more of a pitta picture, pitta and pain often go together, inflammation, rawness, redness. And this is like a very classic pitch of picture. And then you were describing this, like the involuntary muscle movement. And I see this a lot with benzo withdrawal or with insomnia and anxiety where there's like muscle spasms, muscle jerking. If you get like a hypnotic jerk where you like involuntarily flare on going to sleep, it sounds like that could be that involuntary movement comes from vata. Yes. And then, anytime I have, anytime I'm stressed or anything, and um, that will happen. Like when I'm like trying, when I'm falling asleep, you like have like one of those like dreams that you're falling or something like while you're falling asleep and then you're like, <laughs> or you trip or, or that kind of thing that usually has something to do with Vata. Sometimes it also has something to do with Pitta too, because you're stressed. <laughs> <laughs> what if, what would be a good solution for that? So someone's listening to this and they're like, oh my gosh, I get hypnotic jerks. What mm -hmm. would be something that they could do? Yeah. And this, this goes for basically all neurological anxiety, um, just nervous system, nervous system regulation work is the name of the game. And what that means is, um, well, anything that's going to be <laughs> soothing for the nervous system, but I'm a really big fan of bringing, bringing our awareness into our bodies and actually bringing our physical, like touching our physical body with our hands to ground us down. That's one of the fastest tracks to actually calming us down. Uh, breath is breath work is great too. Um, or certain types of breath work is great too for, uh, calming the nervous system. Um, but I find that even like physical touch is even more tangible than breath. Um, right. Like we can do mindset work, but that's, it's not so super tangible. We can do breath work and that's a little bit more tangible because we're working with the, you know, we're working with something that is tangible. We can feel the breath move in and out, but, but actually putting our hands on our body is like, oh, okay. I'm here. I'm actually here. <laughs> so it sounds like what I hear you talking about is like Vata, Vata pacifying stuff, like grounding. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Vata pacifying. It's also Pitta pacifying because, um, a lot of times, so stress and anxiety, we've talked about how that can look different based on if it's Vata, it's more of like all over the place where if it's Pitta, a lot of times it's, it's hyper-focused and stressed about like getting things done. Um, and it feels more of an intense focus stress rather than what with Vata. It's like, oh my gosh, there like there's this and then there's this and then there's this. And your thoughts are just kind of like spiraling over overhead. That's kind of what it feels like. Um, so yeah, so nervous system regulation work will be, be grounding for both Vata and Pitta, which is awesome. 
I'm also thinking about like it for hypnotic jerks, it's like you do golden milk before bed at night. I know that's something like you and I have shared a cup of golden milk together at the end of a day. And that can be really wonderful for Vata. If somebody is not sure if it's like Pitta or Vata, could they still do golden milk? Yes. Anyone can do golden milk. Um, so for Pitta and Vata, like it's going to be, it's going to be great. Uh, maybe you, if you have a ton, a ton of Pitta, maybe doing a little bit less ginger, but for the most part, most people can handle like all of the spices and stuff that are going to be in golden milk. They're mostly tridoshic. Um, and then I would say you could you could change up the type of milk um, that you use depending on the the dosha. So like um, vata might do well. Vata and pitta are actually going to do well with dairy as long as you can actually tolerate dairy. Um, but kapha it might be too heavy for kapha. So kapha might do better with like an almond milk or something like that. Um, yeah, for the most, I, I actually like to do, use like almond milk, uh, regardless of if I have which, whatever dosha is out of balance for me, but then I add ghee so that it, mm-hmm. I do have some of that fat. Um, so I like that. And you guys will learn so much more about this in the Ayurveda course where, yeah. you know, Hadley's introducing like what kind of milk. And I imagine as you're listening to this, it's like, I don't even, I don't even know what kind of milk I should be using, but a, a good take home for this is that if you're getting hypnotic jerks or like spasms and restlessness and involuntary movements at night, restless leg syndrome mm. at night is that an equalizer, like a good hack for most people would be doing golden milk. And then you can go and check out the Ayurveda course and then see what kind of milk might be optimal depending on what needs rebalancing for you. Mm-hmm. But I like that, that this is a tridoshic option. And then um, another tridoshic option that has an affinity for the nervous system is go to cola, which is a really great herb and it's anti-anxiety. It's great for healing the nervous system. It can calm down hyperactive spasming nerves. It can help with sleep. And so these are kind of two take-homes for neurological anxiety. Both of these um, supplements that you would take orally or tridoshic, and then you can supercharge your golden milk, like Hadley, you were saying with your milk type, but go check that out in the course. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as you were saying, it's like, don't just skip over the grounding activities. If it is Vata and it's causing involuntary movements and your thoughts are like racing and busy and all over the places, like do those grounding activities and Hadley teaches a lot on touch and like Mm -hmm. self-massage. And so check out some of our other stuff on that. Yeah. Like you could chug your golden milk (laughs) before bed and still be equally stressed if you're just like, you know, going and like drinking it really fast or, or like, yeah, like, oh, I have to do this for my stress. Go, go, go. And then not, not see any results. So, you know, golden milk is like, I mean, it's like a lovely experience to just have golden milk. So um, usually you aren't going to just chug your golden milk because it's just the experience of drinking it is lovely. Um, but uh, because because it has the nourishing, like it's warm like tea, but it also has the fat. And so it's just like, it's like, I always used to drink like hot chocolate. Like I loved hot chocolate um, and that's kind of, it kind of like fills that void for me. (laughs) Um, so, so make it into the kind of like a little, a little lovely ceremonial kind of thing for yourself, which you probably will if you drink golden milk, but, um, and you can also like put a hand on your heart while you drink it, or like put a hand on your shoulder or put a hand on your head. I like to do like put one hand on your forehead and one hand on the back of your head and just like cradle your head and like lean back it feels so freaking good. Like our heads are heavy. Yeah, <laughs> when We can cradle our heads. It's like a weight off of our shoulders. Literally. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan that y'all. That was yeah. so nice. <laughs> so neurological anxiety, whether you get headaches or neuron shooting nerve pain or muscles are 
weak or tired, which is probably more kapha or um, spasming or burning, you know, focus less on this is happening, what's wrong, but rather what is this kind of general picture that I'm seeing? Does it look more like a kapha or a vata or a pitta? And then identifying strategies that work to restore balance in that moment will help correct your body so that you're not going out of balance as easily. Mm -hmm. What else about neurological anxiety can you think of? The thing that just came to mind for me was um, that's great for both Vata and Pitta, just great for neurological anxiety, like just for your nervous system is um, getting a foam roller and and actually, I mean, foam rolling is great, like rolling out your muscles and stuff, but the life hack that I learned from one of my teachers, Katie Silcox is get, get a long foam rollers long enough. So like, like sort of like more of an extra long one, um, long enough so that you can put your spine, your tailbone on one end and it goes all the way up past your head. Uh, so, so your full body like or your full, um, spine is on there, like parallel to it. So you're not rolling out your muscles, um, with it, like perpendicular to your back, rather you're, you're lining it up along your spine. Um, and just lying down like that and like letting your arms come out to the side that in itself, the way that it hits your body and the way that it allows your body to then open up on the foam roller is super regulating for the nervous system. I like to do my meditations in that position a lot of times if I'm feeling like I have more of that neurological anxiety or if I have more vata or pitta going on, I'll just lay lay down on that and it's awesome. And then after a little bit of time, you can roll it to the side and then just lay your body just on the ground. And then you'll feel that your body actually, if you were to lie on the ground before doing that, and then after doing that, you'll feel that there more of your body is actually like more of your back is actually on the ground because you've opened up your back, um, in the muscles have relaxed enough. So they're not like so tensed up and tight. They've relaxed enough so that they can be on the ground. And that is like, quintessential your nervous system like it's all tensed up and then it, it it settles back so that's another really good hack I love that hack and it goes it's like such a good segue from our conversation last time when we were doing those exercises of extension and contraction so if yeah. you kind of imagine what body posture you take when you're feeling anxious and stressed you, and then doing the opposite and mm-hmm. kind of creating like a back and forth seesaw or rocking motion between the two. And I love what you're describing. And as you were talking about supporting the whole spine is that's how I like to sleep. And so Paul calls it the wall of China, but (laughs) I have like pillows lined up and I like to lay on my right side and have all of the pillows lined up to like be touching my spine all the way up just because it feels grounding and supportive. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of fun to hear you describing that. And so maybe if somebody is listening to this and you're having a hard time sleeping and you do identify with Vata symptoms of like, I'm not grounded. My brain is racing. I'm feeling a little restless. Then maybe doing that stretch Hadley was talking about laying on your back on some long foam roller or a stack of pillows, whatever you have accessible to you. Yeah. I've rolled up like towels before and done it that mm-hmm. way as well. Like, cause I travel, so I can't bring my long yeah. long yeah. roller with me to Europe but in a body bag <laughs> right. this is my foam roller <laughs> it goes where I go yeah so I've used towels you can use yeah yeah, yeah. Get I creative. love that so mm-hmm. yeah try that before bed or maybe even try like supporting your body when you're sleeping with your own pillow wall of China and maybe that will help with the with the sleep if you have insomnia yeah yeah before bed is like an awesome time to do it because it just kind of lets everything go from the day. I think that's brilliant. So um, let's move on to endocrine anxiety. And mm-hmm. this is this is our last of the eight types of anxiety. So if you're really interested in this topic, check out our other podcast episodes. We dive into this in more detail. And I just want to take a moment here to 
just call out the cool work that Hadley's up to is, you know, sh she's happy, healthy Hadley, and she has a beautiful um, online presence. And so make sure that you check out her Instagram and see all the cool stuff that she has going on. You know, she and I have collaborated together to do the Holistic Inner Balance podcast, but she has like a whole world of awesomeness that you definitely don't want to miss. And so go check out her Instagram. She has a link in the bio where you can see what she's up to. One of the cool projects Hadley and I've done together that we keep mentioning periodically, but I want to just mention in more full detail now is the Ayurvedic course where Hadley made this amazing quiz and it's all about helping you become your most successful, amazing, excited, productive, brilliant, beautiful version of yourself. And it's, a really unique quiz and it's definitely my go-to. And so if you're kind of curious, like what, what dosha imbalance might I be in at present? And if it's kind of hard for you to start with the conversations we're having and then figure out where you are is take that quiz. It's really good. It's in the link in her bio. It's on my website. And so if you haven't checked any of that stuff out, definitely do. Cause it's really, really cool stuff. Oh, you're so sweet. Also, you are too humble. Dr. Kane helped me with that quiz. <laughs> and also Dr. Kane has a ton of amazing things on her. Yeah. Instagram as well. So check all of that out too. Yeah. We got to create some more reels and stuff too. Cause that's always a blast. <laughs> Hilarious. We just got to get in the same state at the same time again. So right now I'm in AZ and Hadley's yes. in California. And so yes. we just got to get in the car and yeah, drive the mayhem. six and a half hours. Easy. <laughs> Easy. It's so Easy good. Peasy. Easy peasy. And who doesn't want to be in San Diego in the end of January? It's like that's where it's at. It's where it's happening. Goals. Yes. Goals. <laughs> so what the heck is endocrine anxiety? What is an what is an endocrine? What is that? Mm -hmm. And so I want you to think of glands, organs, and hormones. And endocrine gland, it's the glands that are releasing your hormones. I'm thinking like thyroid hormone, adrenal hormones, sex hormones. And so you have glands and you have all these organs all over your body and they help your metabolism. They help your sexual health. They help your energy. They help your motivation. They help your mood. Everything that's going on head to toe is regulated in part by your endocrine system. And when the endocrine system goes out of balance, we can get quite a lot of really annoying symptoms. And the standard of care will look at labs. And if the labs are out of balance in such a way that they now no longer fit in the brackets that we have determined as normal, then they'll treat you. But what we're looking at here in this conversation is optimizing the health of your organ systems, optimizing the health of your glands, optimizing your levels of hormones, whatever that looks like for you and how to identify signs that they need a little bit of support through exploration of symptoms and with that perspective of Ayurveda and how to restore balance by considering your Ayurveda. And so today we're going to focus on thyroid and adrenal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So we were talking about this beforehand. Um, it's interesting. Ayurveda doesn't necessarily map out perfectly onto the hormonal like uh conversation because you know 2000 2000 to 5000 years ago we don't know exactly when it originated they didn't have this model of hormones and the endocrine system um they had different models and so that's fine and um you know, they had the model of the doshas, which we in Western science don't really have the model of the doshas. Um, and so equal, equally good, whatever, there's no better or worse. And, um, and so there's not like a perfect way to map the doshas onto the endocrine system. However, there are some things that we can talk about that are going to, that when we look at the symptoms, we can see, oh, okay, this is a dosha. This is the dosha that this symptom is. And we'll break it down a little bit because sometimes when we think about hormones, there are a couple things interplaying because like we've talked about how like kapha can come in and, and protect. And, um, you know, sometimes pitta can like burn something out and then like with the fire and then vata comes in and like depletes further because, 
um, because something has been burned out. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, because it's not super like cut and dry. Like if you feel this way, then it's always because of this. Um, we'll, we'll decode, demystify that a little bit today. And then we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to balance each dosha in regards to your symptoms based on your hormonal imbalances. How does that sound? <laughs> I can't wait. I feel like I'm going to learn so much. Um, <laughs> let's start with thyroid. And so your thyroid is a gland that lives in the base of your neck and your thyroid gland in response to a hormone from your brain called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH will release thyroid hormone. And then that thyroid hormone is used from head to toe in lots of metabolic pathways. And so when thyroid hormone is in optimal balance, you feel pretty darn good but as soon as thyroid starts to shift either into too much thyroid or too little thyroid, oftentimes symptoms can develop pretty early on. And so when you're running thyroid, the first thing we want to do is just get basic lab testing so that you kind of know what's going on objectively with your thyroid. And then we're going to combine that information with the information that Hadley's going to bring to the table of how that may present with your doshas. And so the tests that you want to be running at least annually is a TSH. And then there's two types of thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. And T4 converts into T3. And so we want to run both to see how much T4 you're getting. And then we also want to see, well, is it actually converting correctly into the bioavailable or active form called mm -hmm. T3? But there's also a reverse T3, which is what we end up getting if the T4 isn't properly converting. So you can feel hypothyroid even when all of your other numbers look just right. And so you want to run all of them, TSH, free T3, free T4, and a reverse T3. So that's where you want to start. And so let's say that you have symptoms of hyperthyroid. So you have too much T3 or T4, as an example, you're going to experience symptoms of heat intolerance, heart racing, high blood pressure, racing. Oftentimes people feel like hot and fiery and agitated. And so as I'm saying that, if you're not mm -hmm. watching the video, or listening to the recording, Hadley's smiling and nodding because Hadley, <laughs> tell us what this might be reflective of. Well, yeah. If you're listening to this, what is that? Like she literally said fiery, right? <laughs> I did. Yeah. It's like, it is just quintessential. Um, pizza, there's a bit of Vata there as well, because, um, because there's like more of that sort of depletion um, uh, or I guess there's more of like that movement. There's like the high blood pressure and um, and all of that, which is very much related to Pitta as well. So if you think about the type of person who's going to have like high blood pressure and like, you know, maybe have like heart disease later in life, like it's like the type A person who's, who's got a lot of fire in their personality, right? Like they ha tend to have more, uh, that is, that is a type that tends to get more cardiovascular, uh, disease. So, um, all of that stuff is highly, highly, highly related to Pitta for sure. Um, and so we, we can do some things like balance, balancing Pitta for that. That one's, that one's a bit more straightforward, um, which is awesome. I thought I'd throw one straight down the center of the park for us first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, you'll learn tons more in if just the longer that you're in relationship with us here in the podcast, you'll learn more about how to do that. Um, but yeah, you want to cool Pitta. You want to cool mm -hmm. Pitta off. And um, so I had a, a patient who had hyperthyroidism, but she didn't know it. And so she had all of these symptoms where she was really anxious and panicky and restless and her heart was racing and she was losing weight, even though she was really hungry and eating a ton of calories. And the doctor just told her, you're anxious. You need to do some deep breathing and take some Xanax. And thankfully she was a self-advocate and went and got basic labs, including a full thyroid panel, caught the hyperthyroid. And we were able to treat it holistically. And part of her protocol was, as you were saying, Hadley, she's very type A, she was burning herself out. So we had to hit the pause button on some of her behavioral and her lifestyle strategies. But we were also able to use herbs and botanicals to pacify the pitta and calm the thyroid, which 
was great because she didn't end up needing a thyroidectomy. She didn't need any radiation or any surgery or anything. She got better. But I think that's large in part due to the fact that she was able to catch it pretty early. Yeah, totally. And yeah, that's all the having a really, really strong appetite and losing weight is classic. Uh, it's called Tikshna Agni. It's um, basically when your digestive fire is just burning things through. Um, and so, and that relates to the rest of all of the other Pitta symptoms and it's pretty, pretty textbook Pitta. Yeah. <laughs> Lots yeah. of fire. Yeah. Lots so of fire. And so then on the flip side with hypothyroidism, what you might see on your lab test is you might see high TSH. Cause remember TSH is coming from the brain thyroid stimulating hormone, and it's telling the thyroid gland, Hey, make hormone. But the problem may be is if your thyroid isn't doing what it's told and you may have insufficient thyroid hormone being produced, or you may be taking something that's blocking your brain from sending the signal to the thyroid gland. And so whatever is the root cause for you, and there's lots of different root causes, um, but it could produce symptoms of hypothyroidism, which is really quite the opposite of what you see in hyper. And so we're talking about like exhaustion. We're talking about sluggishness. We're talking about like sluggishness of the bowels. So we have more constipation. It's like what was moving and churning along is now slowing to a stop. Yeah. And so Hadley, I know this is a little bit less overtly Pitta. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what might be contributing to some of this? Yeah. So a lot of times people will be like, oh, okay. So I'm experiencing, you know, feeling stuck, feeling sluggish. Things aren't really moving. They're like, oh, it's kapha. So I need to do all these things to balance kapha. I need to work out harder. I need to eat like uh, lighter. Like I need to not eat as, as much fat and sugar. I need to eat more, um, like salads or smoothies or whatever. They're like, because it's kapha, all of these kapha symptoms. That's where it's like, mm it's not quite, it's not quite that because, so when we think about hyper and hypo, hyper means more, there's an overproduction of something. Hypo means there's not enough production of something. And so, um, a vata causes depletion. Vata is like, that's, that's the imbalance of vata will cause depletion regardless of where it is in the body. And so that's, what's causing the depletion of those hormones. And then kapha comes in. So we've got, we've got this depletion. We are feeling really weak and exhausted. That's vata. Feeling weak, um, feeling like, you know, uh, maybe feeling frantic, but then, but then the kapha comes in and makes you like, it, and it grounds down that franticness. It grounds down. Um, it's trying to protect, I mean, not to like over, personify the doshas but like it comes in and this happens often with vata is the kapha will come in to kind of like protect and so that's when we have more of that like sluggishness the slow the stuck feeling um the depressive qualities of uh hypothyroidism um and so we actually like we actually want to balance vata first here so if we if we're like oh it's it's kapha just get up off the couch and go like work out more. Like, no, <laughs> I mean, like we can add some of that, but first we have to do the Vata pacifying stuff. We have to regulate the nervous system. We have to um, be gentle with our poor little Vata bodies that are just, you know, that are being depleted. And then, and then after that, you, well, Usually the, the kapha, it will go away because we've balanced the vata, so we don't, don't have a need for the kapha that's trying to protect it anymore. Um, but we can add on some of the kapha stuff later, but we first need to start with that vata. I think that sounds wonderful. And so then that can actually help if that doshic imbalance is contributing to aggravating or amplifying thyroid health. And just think of health of the glands, health of the body. And so that's what this is really about is how can we identify imbalances in health because of unmet needs, or maybe an overpredominance of something that's problematic. And so we're working on supporting that. And so some people, this is enough to get their thyroid working better, maybe converting more efficiently into active thyroid hormone. 
Um, but I do want to point out here too that if you have hypothyroidism, that it isn't a failure, that it isn't a, a failure on your part if you're taking thyroid medicine and that some of these things are, it's inherited. Some of these things are just the cards that you're dealt with, but you still have the power to optimize the health of your organs, optimize the health of your body. Even if you're still taking thyroid medication and that's just a part of your story, that's okay. And we can put a semicolon or a comma at the end of that and then pursue even greater health with our holistic strategies. And so, yeah, if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I'm hypothyroid and I'm taking medication and I feel good, then like rock and roll, that's really good. Mm -hmm you have an amazing medicine that's got you where you need to be. And so maybe that's not where that's showing up for you anymore. And if your body needs support, it will tell you and it will use different mm -hmm. voices, which is such a mercy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's essentially anything that doesn't feel good in your body is telling you something. It's just, it's, it's just the, the language of the body, right? <laughs> like it's, it's the pretty language. cool actually. <laughs> I love that. The language of the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe we should write a book called The Language of the Body. <laughs> I love it. You guys, would you be interested? Yeah, let us know. <laughs> the body. And so we also were going to touch on autoimmune uh, thyroid. And you know, with autoimmune, I'm thinking like Hashimoto's primarily. We do have autoimmune Graves disease, which can cause hyperthyroidism. But I would look at two compon components of it. One is what's behind an autoimmune process. And then the second is what is happening to you as a result of the autoimmune process. And so with autoimmunity, we have an immune system that's not responding the way that it should. There's immune system dysfunction. And so it can show up in different ways. You can have it shut down organs and you can have Hashimoto's can spike down into hypothyroid, which would be more like we talked about the Kapha Vata thing. Or in Hashimoto's, you can have it shooting up into hyperthyroidism, which may look more like Pitta. But what I think is kind of interesting, I wanted to get your perspective on Hadley, is that it can be very changeable. Yeah. So with Hashis in particular, you can see spikes and drops and spikes and drops, which feels a little bit more from what I'm learning from you. It feels a little bit more Vata because yeah. of that changeability. Totally. Yeah. Anytime we have that changeability, there's going to be some element of Vata. So we've got like, you know, we're kind of going back and forth between what seems like Kapha symptoms, but there's an underlying Vata there. And then also going up into the, um, the Pitta symptoms. So if, you know, if back and forth, um, and that's the case for anything. If you're like, well, I go between being hot and cold, or I go between being um, dry and like oily, like my skin, you know, all of that, any, anything that is like, you go back and forth, there's an element of Vata there. And so we need to ground down the Vata and calm, calm that Vata energy. Um, and obviously there are many ways that we can do that. Um, and we talk about them all the time, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely lots of the Vata there. That's great. So kind of figuring out where to start is, so if you have a hashy state and it's pretty unstable and it's spiking and dropping and you can't figure out what weighs up and what weighs down is starting with the Vata and then once that changeability is a little bit more stabilized, then see where we land. Is it turning into more of like a pitta picture or a kapha picture? Your body will tell you as right. you get healthier, other things will either clear up because they're not needing to jump in and balance, or they'll tell you like, hey, we need some support here. Totally. And the thing is like a lot of, I mean, in ancient India, when Ayurveda was being developed we didn't have a whole lot of autoimmune <laughs> issues back then. We didn't have as much, as much of that. Um, and so there wasn't as much like of this model of care. Um, but we can still use the doshas to, to look at these things. And so, yeah, so definitely work with a doctor on these things. Like the, it's a, it's beyond the scope of this, of like a podcast to like, listen to, and then like fix your hormones <laughs> is what I guess I'm trying to say. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yeah. Have a good doctor that gets it. And if yes. they're confused, send them this podcast. Then yeah. <laughs> they will be more confused. Just they will be. Yeah. <laughs> 
So as we're finishing up here, we do have one more organ system that we did want to chat about and cover in endocrine anxiety. And so it's adrenals. And so Hadley, have you ever heard of adrenal fatigue? Yes. And I'm so fascinated about this because you just like off the cuff the other day were like, yeah, well, that's not really real. And I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Adrenal fatigue is not real. It doesn't really exist. And so I know that half of our listeners here are going to be, well, that's wrong. My doctor, who I really respect and who's really intelligent, told me I have adrenal fatigue. And then the other half where you're like, oh, finally, somebody understands the science of adrenals. I love it. Tell us more. I'm very fascinated about this because I was, you know, under the impression that it was. So you have a gland in your body. Actually, you have two and they live on top of your kidneys and your back and they're called adrenal glands. And these glands release many different chemicals and hormones, namely of which we always focus on is cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone and it has lots of different jobs. And so Cortisol can rise and cortisol can drop and it should do that. It, it, it should have a pattern of rising in the morning and then going down through the afternoon and being at its lowest in the evening. And so when cortisol levels spike in the morning, what happens is you get this burst of energy. It helps you get out of bed. It wakes you up. It mobilizes blood sugar. It increases your heart rate. It increases your blood pressure And it increases energy. And so those things that we associate with cortisol being too high would be too much of all of that. And so super high cortisol, which we can see in, you know, certain diseases like Cushing's would be really high blood pressure and really high um, blood sugars because cortisol is like pulling the sugar out so we can use it to run away from the tiger. And so all of these symptoms that we associate with adrenergic arousal, sympathetic arousal, fight, flight, freeze, you know, all of those hyper symptoms. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we can have too low cortisol where the adrenals aren't producing enough cortisol. And that's what people call adrenal fatigue. And What's actually happening is that when you have insufficient amounts of cortisol is it can look like a disease called Addison's, Mm -hmm. Addison's syndrome. And so what you'll find is that you'll be lethargic and tired, which checks out, right? People will say that they're lethargic and tired, but you will also find that your blood pressure is low. Your heart rate is low. Your blood sugars are low. And so cortisol, when it's high, it's going to help you run from the bear. And when cortisol is really low, it's going to make you very flatlined, very depleted. And so the problem why I'm telling you that adrenal fatigue doesn't exist is because when people are defining adrenal fatigue, they're typically gaining weight and they have high blood pressure and they're tired. Well, that's not adrenal insufficiency. That's a mix of adrenal function. It's more of a disease of lifestyle. But if you have true adrenal insufficiency, you're going to have low blood sugar, low blood pressure, plus Mm. fatigue. And so if you, if you've been diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, you should get your adrenals tested and look at your overall cortisol levels, and then look at how your body is presenting those symptoms and see in what dosha they may be fleshing out to need pacifying and need support from. So let's look at the example of too low cortisol. So if someone comes in, they have Addison's disease. They don't have enough cortisol. And so again, their blood sugars are low. Their blood pressure is low. They're lethargic. They're tired. They just want to be like a blob on the couch. Right? So sounds to me, I'm not the expert with you, but it sounds to me very kapha Yes. Yes, totally. Well, and it's, uh, it's kapha. So let's see. Yeah. Mostly just kapha. <laughs> I'd say. Um, However, there's an underlying vata because it is an insufficiency of the hormone. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. depletion. So there's, so vata has come in and depleted the hormone that we need where, I mean, you can still, there's still some vata if there's like a high amount of cortisol too. So that's why it doesn't map out perfectly, but um, 
but there is some vata there too because it because of that depletion and so so the while it's showing up as purely kapha there is also that that piece of vata as well so how do you usually um like what lifestyle changes do you usually use with addisons and then we can talk a little bit about you know why that might map out onto kapha or vata we want to tonify. We want to use adaptogens. We want to build up the adrenals. I'm thinking of Addison's and in that we often just give cortisol. We give hydrocortisone. Mm, um, okay. But we also can see this kind of a picture in chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. So if yeah. somebody's acute PTSD, like if they're in an acute state of trauma, we often see higher levels of cortisol because the body is in this fight, flight, freeze response trying to protect mm-hmm. you. But after it's become chronic and your adrenals are really, truly insufficiently equipped, then Mm -hmm. we want to holistically, naturopathically, we would use adaptogens. And so you would pick herbs Mm -hmm. that are balancing your dosha that also nourish and feed the adrenal glands. And so adaptogenic herbs as examples would be like rhodiola, ashwagandha, glyceriza, um, panics, ginseng, and making your own botanical blends that take consideration of your whole person, plus what you're trying to accomplish with your adrenals can be incredibly helpful. And so just to give you an example, I had this engineer that I worked with years ago and he had burned himself out. He was like a classic pitta, mm-hmm. like burning the candle at both ends. And he ended up with hypocortisol symptoms. And so adrenal hypofunction. Mm-hmm. And so so not I enough guess, cortisol. He didn't for, have enough for anyone cortisol. who doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He didn't have enough cortisol, and so he's he ended up in like this very kind of cough of state, but it was caused by too much pitta. So we made lifestyle changes yeah. to try to help him not burn out the little <laughs> vitality that he had left, and we gave him a lot of trophy restoratives and adaptogenic herbs and nutrients that are just delicious and helpful for the adrenal glands. And he ended up getting a lot better. His PCP had get him, given him hydrocortisone, which we were able to get him off of and then build him up naturally. And he's now, he has much more balanced lifestyle and his adrenal health is great. Yeah. So instead of being like, well, oh, you have all these cough symptoms of like feeling like lethargic and sluggish and like lying on the couch and all that, like get up and move. You better like do more. No, no. He had, he had depleted himself from his lifestyle through pizza, the fire, and then that kind of burned, burned it out. And then Vata comes in after the burnout and just is depletion. And, and so um so yeah so so pitta can cause that that depletion and that's when then we have the kapha that comes in the kapha symptoms that come in and so when we when we treat the root cause of the symptoms or yeah when we treat the root dosha i guess um because some of these what we what we call it in ayurveda is like vata so it's like pitta pushing vata pushing kapha like it's like (laughs) these levels um and so that doesn't you know it doesn't really matter the exact the exact um like which one is pushing which or whatever but like what's the root what's the root of it and the root is his pitta and so we just have to look at the lifestyle that caused the symptoms and then we can see oh of course and then we can treat those I love that validation because at that time, this was like in 2011 and I didn't, it was more like following vital, vital resiliency, like the mm. wisdom of the, my teachers who were not studied or trained in Ayurveda. And so I'm really grateful that it's like, oh, great. What I did lined up. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's yeah. always so nice. Cause it That's makes a thing. sense once you yeah. like into yeah. it. Like what yes. you say, I'm like, oh yeah, of course. That makes sense. Yeah, right. Like the doshas just make sense. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Even my husband, who is like the most science-based, logic minded, like he can get behind the doshas. <laughs> like mm-hmm. he can get fully behind them. So <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so I feel like we talked a little bit about hypocortisol, Addison's, low cortisol. And then on the flip side, too high cortisol that can cause Cushing's. I think that can cause kind of a mixed picture because some people, they do, they get the 
like the striations in the skin. And then they start like retaining fluid in different parts of their body. So it's interesting because I feel like there is a kapha component with that fluid retention, Mm -hmm. but there is also like the high blood pressure and the faster heart rate and the higher sugar. And so what, what would you do if it, if it seems like kind of a mixed picture like that? Yeah. I mean, again, it always comes down to what was the lifestyle before that, that led to the symptoms. And then we can kind of see, oh, okay, that's the root of what the symptoms were. Um, And so then we can treat it. And when I say treat it, like I use lifestyle, like I don't, I don't um, like prescribe anything or, you know, uh, that, or (laughs) I guess I prescribe lifestyle. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But, you know, then we could, we would, balance the things that we were doing before that were causing the imbalance, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And you had broken that up into like three kind of take homes when you and I were talking about this, as you said, you know, really when in doubt, digestion, sleep, and stress. Yeah, that's it. Like, if you like, if you don't take anything else away from any of the episodes we've ever done, it is that it is digestion, sleep, and stress levels. Take care of that. And then you're, you're good to go. And there's a lot there, right? Like digestion is, you know, it's like the home of all of these imbalances in Ayurveda. It's like digestion is so, so important. Digestion, sleep, and stress. Those, those are the, the, the three things that are like the most important. So we can look at when we look at the the lifestyle that the person was having like how was their digestion what was causing any digestive symptoms that then probably led to other things um you know how was their sleep that definitely would lead to other things if it if their sleep wasn't um optimal quality and quantity um and then stress levels obviously um have a lot to do with endocrine anxiety, <laughs> obviously. Um, but yeah, so we got to look at those three things and just, and start and just constantly we're balancing those three things. Digestion, sleep, and stress. Mm-hmm. I'd love to add a bonus extra credit because I do have a lot of like type mm-hmm. three Enneagram. Like I want the extra credit achievement. So can <laughs> I throw in a bonus for that? Yes. I'll give you a gold star. (laughs) Give me a gold star. So for all y'all overachievers out there, the bonus would be moving blood and lymph. Oh yeah. So good. And so stagnation, no bueno. We want to move blood and lymph, whether that is stretching or exercising, or we use hydrotherapy uh, for this, Mm. whether it's like alternating hot and cold, or we can talk about castor oil packs. Um, Acupuncture is moving energy, moving chi. Mm -hmm. And um, so I I would say digestion, self-massage, movement. Yeah. So, oh, I love that self-massage, move blood and lymph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you're listening to this and you're reflecting on your stress and you're reflecting on your digestion and your sleep is ask yourself, what are the canaries, the voices of your symptoms? What are they telling you needs healing and how, Mm -hmm. and then let us know, let us know what's coming up for you. And we'll be here to help you kind of clarify if you have questions, like throw us a comment and then we'll try to help you work through it. We're here. Yeah. Like we will do, we could totally do more episodes on whatever you are actually, you know, going through, feel free to reach out and ask questions. And cause we want to make this as relevant for you as possible. And so if you're the kind of person who's going to take charge of their life and ask a question to us, we want to give you the answer. <laughs> yep. Um. So be, be an advocate for yourself, ask us so we can do more episodes about what you actually need. This has been fun. The eight oh, types of anxiety, so y'all. We just did the eight <laughs> types. We finished it up today. So go and check out our other episodes. They're so fun. Mm-hmm. Then I've learned a ton. And so I'm sure you guys will too. Yes. Yeah. And then check out our Ayurveda mini course. If you want to dive deeper into all of the doshas and how to actually balance them with lifestyle and the types of foods that you're eating and the types of herbs that you, you know, are taking and all of these great things. We have a whole, a whole mini course filled with 
lots of goodness and, uh, you know, a whole workbook in there that'll help you actually implement this stuff into your specific life to tailor it to you. Um, so that's where the doshas really shine, tailoring it to you. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for being here. We'll see you next time on the Holistic Inner Balance. Bye.